Good evening. This lecture is going to be discussing nuclear chemistry. We will focus on the definition of radioactivity, nuclear decay equations, and nuclear particles, and finally half-lives. A quick review of terms that will be important for this presentation. Nucleons, particles that are found inside the nucleus of an atom. These will be neutrons and protons. Again, neutrons are the neutrally charged particles. Protons are the positively charged particles. Atomic number, which will be the number of protons that are in the nucleus. And the mass number, the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. An isotope, atoms with identical atomic numbers but different mass numbers. Again, they will differ in the number of neutrons that are found in the atom and a nuclide, which is a general term for an isotope, so it's just a unique atom. We're going to begin our focus on radioactive decay. A radioactive nucleus is a nucleus that spontaneously decomposes, which means that it will happen without any outside influence, forming a different nucleus and producing one or more particles as well as energy. An example of a nuclear decay equation is shown below. When we look at this nucleus here, the carbon-14 atom, please remember that this 14 represents the mass number and the 6 represents the atomic number. So in this particular instance, what is going to take place is we are going to have one of the neutrons from the carbon transform into an extra proton and it's going to eject an electron from that nucleus. When you're looking at these decay equations, you can essentially set up an equation for the top and the bottom numbers here, the A and the Z, and treat the arrow as an equal sign. So in this instance, I can have 14 equals 14 plus zero, and on the bottom equation, 6 equals 7 plus a negative 1. Most of the time when you guys have these decay equations, what you're going to find is that you'll have a blank missing for one of these two substances, and you have to determine what that will be. Radioactive materials were first discovered back in the late 1800s by a gentleman named Henry Becquerel. He found that uranium ores, which they called pitch blend, were able to expose photographic film in a dark room. And so he knew that some type of hidden radiation must be given off in order to expose the film. Marie and Pierre Curie were created, uh, credited with discovering the elements radium and polonium, both of which are radioactive materials. They won Nobel Prizes for their work and later died from all the exposure to the radioactive material. Next, we're going to discuss the properties of radioactive nuclides. They affect the light sensitive emulsion on a photographic film. So again, this is basically developing the film in a dark room, the way how they used to do that in the old days. They produce an electric charge in the surrounding air, so they will ionize the air. We'll talk more about ionization in upcoming presentations. They produce fluorescence or phosphorescence with certain compounds. So again, that would be like a glowing of the compounds when they're exposed to the radiation. Their radiations have physiological effects that are minimized by time, distance, and shielding, and they undergo radioactive decay, emitting nuclear or ionizing radiation. We're now going to discuss the different types of radioactive decay. The first type is going to be an alpha particle. The alpha particle, if you remember from class, we discussed yesterday is the helium nucleus, and that is the 4,2-He, or you have the alpha sign with the 4 and the 2. We talked about this with the gold foil experiment, if you recall, where Ernest Rutherford shot gold, uh, alpha particles at a piece of gold foil and saw that they had a few of those alpha particles returned back from the gold foil back to the, uh, towards the apparatus and had a great degree of deflection, which was not what they had expected. But when we look at this alpha particle, you're going to see with that alpha decay or the alpha emission, 
anytime that you're emitting something, you're going to see that particle appear on the right side of the arrow. So the particle is found on the right of the arrow. And then if we have a capture, then you'll find the particle on the left of the arrow. So it's just a little bit of an easier way to distinguish whether the particle is being emitted, which is being released, or being captured. Now, when we typically talk about these types of equations, we generally say that the substance that's found on the left side of the arrow is the reactant, and the substance found on the right side is a product. So as we look at this equation here, again, we have our mass numbers, the A on the top, and we have our atomic number, or the Z, on the bottom. So setting up our equation, 222 equals 4 plus 218. The radium atom is going to lose two protons and two neutrons for that total of four, leaving it with a grand total of 218. 86 for the number of protons, and then 132 for the number of neutrons. In our second example, you can see here 23090 thorium is going to break down into that alpha particle plus radium 22688. So again, the major point of impact here, you're going to have a loss of 4 for the mass number and a loss of 2 in the atomic number. The next type of particle that we are going to discuss is the beta particle. The beta particle, you can see it termed as a beta emission, beta decay. That is going to be an electron that is ejected from the nucleus of the atom. You may remember from class yesterday that the electron is found outside of the nucleus. So you might be saying to yourself, wait a second, how can the electron be leaving the nucleus? And when we talk about that, we have to discuss the origins of the neutron. So the neutron was created when a very fast moving electron collides with a proton with such force that they essentially stick together and mold into a single particle. So if you can envision it where here is your proton and then here is your electron, that makes up the neutron itself. And so when this beta decay happens, you have the neutron split apart the electron is ejected from the nucleus and it leaves the proton. So what you're going to find is that in this process, the net effect again is to change a neutron to a proton. So the mass number stays the same because you lose one neutron, but you gain a proton. But you're going to see that the atomic number will increase by one. You can see in this example, I went from 90 to now 91. So again, think about my equal sign, 91 plus a minus one equals 90. And you'll notice up top, the 234 remains the same, okay? So whenever you write this, you can have this as the zero minus one E, or you could also do zero one, zero minus one, excuse me, and the beta symbol for that as well. So either one would be acceptable for that beta particle. Again, this beta particle is being emitted, so it's found as a product. Your next one is going to be a gamma ray. A gamma ray is a high energy photon. The photon, by definition, is just a tiny particle-like bundle of energy. This will typically accompany another type of radioactive decay. Gamma radiation is by far the worst type of nuclear radiation that someone can be subjected to. 
with this because it is just energy you'll find that there will be no change in the mass number or the atomic number from the gamma energy but as I said you'll notice right here in this example I have an alpha particle so it is accompanying an alpha decay in this situation so the uranium 238 is releasing alpha particles it's producing the 234 and 90 which is thorium and then it's producing two units of radiation this is the gamma radiation you'll notice it's zero and zero for the mass number and the atomic number that's why there is no change in the mass number or the atomic number of the element You are only responsible for the first three types of the radioactive decay, the alpha, beta, and gamma particles. However, there are other types of radioactive decays that can take place, and so I just wanted to take a moment to go over those very briefly with you. So when we look at this, the next type that we have is what we call a positron decay. And with a positron, it is a particle with the same mass as an electron, but with a positive charge. So you kind of think about this as being an antimatter particle. So essentially you have a positively charged proton that gets ejected from the nucleus. So when you see that the mass number stays the same. However, the number of protons will decrease by one. The net of effect is to change a proton into a neutron. Next, we will discuss an electron capture. So the electron capture is a process in which one of the inner orbital electrons is captured by the nucleus. The net effect here is to change a proton into a neutron. You can see that here, 80 plus a minus one forms 79. So we're losing a proton. The mass is staying the same. So as we lose a proton, we're gaining an electron. So we're gonna lose a proton, but we're gonna add a neutron, so no change in mass and I just want to describe this process here just a little bit more so if we think about a Bohr model which you guys probably saw in about eighth grade where you have the nucleus right here and then you had little rings of electrons that are just kind of floating around the outside we're going to dispel that myth a little bit later next week but you're going to see you'd have like two a electrons eight electrons eight electrons so on and so forth so what's going to happen is one of these electrons is going to be attracted to the nucleus and is going to essentially be pulled in and combined with that proton and so now what's going to happen is one of those outer electrons would now come down and fill in the empty spot where that other electron previously existed it's going to release energy in that process that would be that gamma radiation or that ionizing radiation that it was talking about and then you have the new atom that is created in the process so again here's just a little chart that gives you a brief overview of all the different types of particles here so again the ones that you are responsible for are the beta decay the alpha decay and the gamma emission now just a couple of things here they give you the symbols for each of these again this could be that 4 2 he as well for the alpha particle and then they give you the charge the change in the masses change in atomic numbers change in the mass number they give you a relative speed typically the more massive the particle is the slower it is going to move and then finally, this is the last thing that I just wanted to briefly touch on, is this penetrating ability. So essentially what this is talking about is how far the radiation will move away from its source and also how far it can penetrate through matter. So a beta decay can go anywhere between 5 and 15 feet in the air. So that means that, again, when it ejects that electron, eventually as it goes away from the source it will have that electron get absorbed by different atoms or molecules in the air and will create ions it can travel through paper
but it is not strong enough to penetrate aluminum foil or wood. When we look at the alpha decay, it is a very slow particle. It is only going to move two to eight inches in the air before it gets absorbed, taking in electrons and just becoming helium gas. It cannot travel through paper, skin, or clothing. This is going to be very important for what we're going to look at as a case study tomorrow. So keep this in your memory bank because that is going to become important. And then finally, your gamma emission. As I was saying, it was the deadliest form of radiation that we have. This one will travel several, several miles in the air, and it can go through several feet of concrete or several inches of lead. So if you think back to the Cuban Missile Crisis when everybody was building their bomb shelters, this is why, because of the radiation that was gamma emissions that would be released when the bombs would go off. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of time here to do a quick concept check. So this question first is asking you which of the following produces a beta particle. So remember a beta particle is an electron that is released and again it will have a negative charge. So at the beginning we can see here I have a negatively charged electron. However, it is located on the reactant side not the product side. So this is asking us to produce a beta particle. So A is not our correct answer. When we look at the second example, 6229Cu is producing zero positive one E. This right here, again, would be a positron, not a beta particle. So that is also not our correct answer. For C, when we have francium undergoing radioactive decay, You'll notice it is producing 4, 2, and HE, so that is an alpha particle, so that would not be a correct answer as well. And finally, you can see the 0, minus 1, E. Now it's on the product side, so that becomes a beta particle. This one right here, remember, because it's an electron that is a reactant, that would be the electron capture instead. Okay, for our next concept check, we are going to actually produce one of these nuclear decay equations. So for this one, if we look at the bombardment of americium 243.95 with alpha particles, this will lead to the emission of a neutron. Which nuclide will be formed in this nuclear transformation process? So again, it's saying that it is bombarding this particle with alpha particles, which means that this alpha particle will also be a reactant. So I'm going to take the 243.95 AM. I'm going to add to that the alpha particle, which if you remember is 42 and HE. It tells me it produces one neutron, so 10N and then I have a blank. So as I was saying, what you want to do for this is set up an equation for the top and also for the bottom. So again, the top is your mass number, the bottom again is your atomic number. So I will have 243 plus four, the arrow is the equal sign, and then I have one plus, and if we just put A and Z, and some element X, I have one plus A. So for my top equation, 243 plus four, that's 247 equals one plus A. So my A is going to equal 246. So I know for my blank, I can use 246. For my bottom equation, I have 95 plus two equals zero plus Z. So I know my Z would be 97. So when I look at that, 246, 97, that is berkelium, BK. So my correct answer should be D. 
Okay, we're going to do one last concept check on nuclear transformations or the decay reactions. And in this concept check, we're going to determine the particle emitted and the type of radioactive decay present in the following example. So just like we've done before, we want to set up an equation for the top, which again is our mass number. And to solve for that, we have 44 plus 1 equals 44 plus A. So we know in this case that our A must equal 1. And for our bottom equation, we're trying to solve for the Z, our atomic number. And we have 20 plus 1 equals 21 plus Z. So in this case, the Z must equal 0. So going back to your little chart with all the different symbols for the particles, if I have a positive 1 for the mass and a 0 for the atomic number, that means that it was a neutron that was produced. So the type of particle would be a neutron emission. So we have a neutron emission here for this decay process. Oftentimes we talk about nuclear radiation, but we never discuss why something is radioactive. So for this, we need to talk about the stability of the nucleus. So when we talk about nuclear stability, this is all based on the ratio of the neutrons to the protons within that nucleus. For elements that have small atomic numbers, meaning that they have very few protons in the nucleus, less than 20, they typically will have a ratio of 1 to 1. This ratio will continue to increase to approximately 1.5 to 1 as the atomic number increases between 20 and 83. When you get above 83, none of the nuclei are stable, but they typically have a ratio somewhere approximately 2 to 1 for the neutron to proton ratio. Now, the reason for this is you have all these positively charged particles that are inside of the nucleus that would typically tie, uh, repel each other. What happens, though, is the more neutrons that are added, they act kind of like a glue that are holding all those other protons in place. The nuclei with a neutron to proton ratio that's greater than their predicted stable ratio generally will decay by beta emission, which we will talk about shortly, which lowers the ratio of the neutrons to protons and releases additional energy through the ejected beta particle. Nuclei with a neutron to proton ratio less than the predicted stable ratio generally decay by positron or alpha emission or electron capture which all raise this ratio and release additional energy through the ejected positron or alpha particle, or in the case of electron capture, through the emission of rays as electrons fall from a higher energy level to a lower one to fill the orbital vacated by the captured electron. Again, this is all very heavy stuff here. We will discuss this aspect of the electrons falling from one energy level to another next week so don't worry about that and then nuclei beyond atomic number 83 are all unstable and generally decay by a combination of beta and alpha emissions we are now going to talk about the concept of a half-life the half-life is the amount of time that it takes for one half of the original radioactive atoms to decay into the atoms of the new element the other half remains unchanged. So a couple of vocabulary terms that you need to be familiar with. The parent nuclide is your original nucleus. So again, this would be the reactant that we would see for that decay equation like we've been talking about for the last few examples. We have the daughter nuclide. This is the new nucleus that is being produced. So this will be your product that gets formed. Every radioactive isotope or radioisotope has a characteristic rate of decay measured by its half-life. So kind of think about that like a fingerprint almost. So just as a quick little example, we know that the radium-223-88 undergoes alpha decay. We talked about this before in one of our examples. So it would have the 4,2-HE, and it would have RN-218, or no, that'd be 219 on that one, and then 86. 
the radium 88223 that would represent the parent nuclide and the 21986 radon that would represent the daughter nuclide the stability of a radioisotope is indicated by its half-life the longer the half-life is the more stable the isotope half-lives can vary from fractions of a second to billions of years most artificially produced isotopes have a very short half-life now when we talk about this artificially produced isotope typically we're talking about the atomic numbers that are above 92 uranium which is element number 92 is the last naturally occurring isotope so you have natural transmutations that can occur which would be for radioactive particles decaying that are starting off below atomic number 92 and then you have artificial transmutations which are going to be for the elements that are above atomic number 92. In order to solve half-life problems we have five variables that we can work with. The first is the MO which is the original mass or the amount of the isotope that is present initially you have mt the mass or the amount of the original isotope that's remaining at time t t would be your time that has elapsed t1 half would be the half-life and n represents the number of half-lives now you can see a couple of different ways to work through these equations uh, I've tried to simplify it a little bit more so that way you don't have to use fractions. So most of the time, most textbooks that you're going to see, you're going to have T over T one half equaling N. That's a standard equation. But a lot of times what you have is you'll see MT divided by MO equals one half raised to the N power. Now for me, I've always found that kids typically have a little bit more difficult time dealing with fractions. So I've kind of just modified this second equation and I've created the inverse of those. So by switching the MO and the MT, I'm going to also switch the one half to a two. So I'm going to transform that into MO divided by MT now will equal two raised to the n power instead that way it's a little bit easier to recognize what power you're raising to to in order to solve something rather than one half so just make sure typically you're going to have to use both equations to solve a problem your interconnected piece typically is the n so a lot of times you're going to have to use either the masses to solve for n or you're going to have to use the times to solve for n and then plug that into the second equation so we're now going to look at a couple of examples i hope this makes sense to you guys here but if you want to use the original equation mt over mo the mass at times t versus the mass originally equaling one half to the n please feel free to do that. I'm just trying to give you guys a little shortcut to help you figure it out. So let's look at a few example problems so you can see how to work through these half-life problems. In our first example, we have what mass of an isotope remains after 10 and a half years if you start with 25 grams. The half-life of the isotope is three and a half years. When I would work through these problems, the first thing I would do is I wanna look and focus on the units so I see years, years, and grams. So again, right now at this point, they're telling me the total amount of time that has elapsed is 10 and a half years. So that would be T. And then they tell me the half-life time is three and a half years. So that's gonna be my T one half. So now, if I'm starting with 25 grams, it wants to know the mass of the isotope that will remain after the 10 and a half years. So I need to determine how many half-lives have taken place. So I'm going to do that by using my first equation, T divided by the T one half equals N. So I have 10.5 years, which I'm just going to abbreviate as YRS, divide that by 
3.5 years, and I'm gonna find that my n is equal to three. So I'm gonna have three different half-lives that are going to take place. Now I realize probably in eighth grade, they told you to take 25 and multiply it by one half three times to get your answer. But again, we're now in honors chemistry, so that's not how we're gonna do things. So in this case, we would take that original amount that we were discussing. So I'm taking my MO, gonna divide it by the MT, which we're trying to solve for, and that's gonna equal two raised to the N power, which again would be two to the third. So that would give me 25 over MT, equals eight. So if I rearrange that equation to solve for MT, I'd multiply both sides by MT and divide by eight. So 25 divided by eight is going to give me approximately 3.13 grams. So now let's look at our second example problem. How long would it take for a sample to decay to 12 and a half percent of its original mass if the half-life is 500 years. So for this problem, we're gonna to have to go in a little bit different approach. So when we look at the 12.5%, we wanna figure out what 12.5% would look like as a fraction. So in this case, 12.5% would essentially be one over eight. So that would now be equal to one half raised to that n power. So like we did before, if you want to take the inverse of that, you could say eight equals two raised to the n power. This is where it'd be a little helpful if you have your different percentages matched up to the fractions, but you can always plug that into your calculator. In either case, my n would equal three. You could also think in the old school fashion, going from 100 down to 50, that would be your half-life number one, going from 50 to 25, that would be half-life number two, and half-life 12.5 on number three would get you to that point. So either way, you've got three half-lives that you can use for that. So now, if the half-life is 500 years, now I have my n equals t over t one half. So three equals t over 500 years. So I multiply both sides by 500 years, and I know that my t would equal 1,500 years. Okay, so we're now gonna do our next concept check, and it says that strontium-90 is a byproduct of nuclear fission and a contaminant associated with the testing of nuclear weapons. It is particular of particular concern to humans because it tends to become concentrated in bones, substituting for calcium, similar ionic radii and a two plus ionic charge. We'll talk about that much more later. The half-life of strontium-90 is 29 years. If an individual ingests milk contaminated with strontium-90, what percentage of the beta particle emitting 9038SR would remain in his or her body after 58 years? So in this case here, since the half-life is 29 years, we have T over the T one half equals N. So I'd have 58 divided by 29 for my number of years. So that would undergo two half-lives. So as a result, two half-lives, that would mean that I'd have one half raised to the second power, which would be one fourth. So I'd have one fourth of the original substance remaining and one fourth would equal 25%. Okay, the last portion of our lesson is just going to quickly talk about the different types of nuclear energy. We have two types of nuclear processes that can take place, fusion and fission. For the first type, fusion, you're taking two lighter nuclei and you're combining them to form a heavier nucleus. In fission, you're splitting a heavy nucleus into two nuclei with smaller mass numbers. Here we have a typical example of nuclear fission where we have a 
chain reaction taking place with the fission of uranium-235. What will take place is you'll have the bombardment of the atom by a neutron. And as that neutron comes in, you kind of think about it like a bowling ball, it will make that nucleus more unstable to where it will split apart. It'll form two smaller nuclei. Notice the atomic numbers, 36 and 56, will add up to equal 92. So I'll have the nucleus split up into two parts, and then it's going to also produce three more neutrons. This is essentially the beginning to what we would call a chain reaction, where each of those neutrons could then go and do the same thing to three new uranium atoms. And so you have an exponential process of splitting more nuclei, and it will release a tremendous amount of energy somewhere in the magnitude of 2 trillion or 20 trillion joules per mole. We'll talk about that mole concept a little bit later. The next type is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is a process of combining two lighter nuclei to form one heavier nucleus. This will produce much more energy per mole than nuclear fission will. Unfortunately, right now on the Earth, it is not possible for us to create a fusion reactor. Fusion is the process that takes place in the stars to produce their energy. So you can see here as an example, you can find that you have two hydrogen atoms that combine together to produce a heavier hydrogen atom plus that electron or positron emission that you would see. You could also have two hydrogen atoms combined together to form a helium atom and that would also produce energy which would be in that form of gamma radiation you could have two heliums produced uh, coming together to produce another helium and two hydrogen atoms as well and uh, this would be an example of what's taking place in the stars how all these different elements were created was through the fusion when these particles would combine together, the hotter the stars are, the heavier the elements that they would be able to produce.